Hello, I'm Dr Jane McCartney. I'm a psychologist in the UK and I'm absolutely fascinated by the criminal mind. What their thoughts were, why they committed the crimes, what their attitude was towards the situation, the victim, the courts, that type of thing. And in these psychology of crime videos, I'm going to look a little bit behind the headlines, behind the scenes, and give you my kind of expert opinion about what they were likely thinking at a few crucial points in their crime. So today, I wanted to look at Max Clifford. Now, he may not be known worldwide, but he's certainly known in the UK. He was a publicist for many, many years, and people would go to him if they had stories to hide or things to promote. And he kind of reigned as Britain's, you know, absolute supreme publicist for many, many years. He had a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, and he had also a lot of influence over people. So before we get into the video, if I could ask you to please like and subscribe, really important, and please feel free to make some comments. I always read what people have to say, and I'm always really interested to, to share your thoughts, have a little debate about what you might be thinking about as well. So Max Clifford, he was eventually convicted of, I think it was about eight counts of serious sexual assault, um, indecent assault as we, we call it here. And he was convicted and jailed in 2014. He would subsequently, while still in jail, still protesting his innocence, trying try to take the, the conviction to the Court of Appeal, he died suddenly of a heart attack in 2017. It was subsequently taken to the Court of Appeal because it was such a high-profile case in the UK and it was found to be upheld. It was as simple as that. So he would be convicted of serious sexual assault on young women and girls, the youngest of which potentially was 12, but apparently this took place in Spain and it didn't come under the jurisdiction of the UK courts. So the youngest I think he was convicted for in the UK was either 14 or 15. I'm not entirely sure, but very young. And I think the oldest conviction of the person was, I think they were at age of 19. But these were just four women. He would have had dozens, so many uh, attacks on women and people would come and see him and they'd be kind of in awe of his celebrity friends and his political contacts and right from the beginning he would take total and utter advantage of that so let's just have a think about let's just take one case so uh, somebody came to see him all a bit starstruck wanted to get into the media business which is what a lot of people would do they'd contact him he'd say yes come along and see me let's see what we can do for you and if he felt that he was going to get something from this relationship whether it was a, a sexual something whether it was a money something I don't know or an influence something I don't know but he would take that person on but to a lot of these girls, it would come at the cost. And it, the cost was that he would be assaulting them. He would be doing all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into it in this video, and I'm sure there's lots out there. So if you really particularly wanted to know, the, the case isn't that long ago, so it's still on, on a lot of websites. And he would completely, totally and utterly take advantage of this. Now, the irony of this was that he was investigated under the Metropolitan Police's Operation Yew Tree, which started after the Jimmy Savile affair. Now, again, for you that don't know, Jimmy Savile was um, an ancient old radio presenter in the UK, been around for years and years and years, but the man had such influence over authorities, over politicians, over the medical establishment, it turned out, when he died, and he was just a lecherous paedophile for all of his life. Apparently, at one point, he was even allowed to go into a reform school for girls. And the authorities knew what he was doing. Apparently, he would go round at night time. And the girls were told, even by the staff, pretend you're asleep, pretend you're asleep, pretend you're asleep, because he'd literally go and pick these girls out of bed. It was just absolutely frightful and awful. And for years, this man got away with it. But because of the backlash of that, they launched quite major investigations into well-known people who there'd been rumours around for lots and lots of times. And one of them was Max Clifford. So they looked into this, they got their convictions, but at the time of his crimes that he was committing, and again, remember, there would have been absolutely dozens of them, he would have thought, you know, I'm, I'm coercing you, I'm kind of manipulating you, but you know what you're doing. I'm Max Clifford, this is the media industry, this is the public relations industry, you know exactly what you're doing by walking in my door. I could be anybody 
in the West End, anybody to do with media in the West End, and it would be exactly the same. He would have convinced himself that. There's some really good people that work in media and PR, of course there are, that don't take advantage. But he would have convinced himself because he would have heard rumours about other people. You know, this is an age-old problem that's been around for years. And he would have convinced himself that he was just doing what everybody has done, you know, the casting couch, if you like, for years and years and years. And he would have manipulated them, he would have coerced them, he would have threatened them because he was... Again, a classic, classic narcissist. He had no sympathy, compassion for people. What he wanted was what he got. He would be in control of the situation. It was powerful. It was thrilling to him. Every single time one of these poor girls would have walked through his door, it would have been thrilling for him. And his sense of self-importance and self-indulgence to that would have just been escalated every single time. And the fact that he doesn't get caught year after year, assault after assault, again, would have just to him, justified exactly what he was doing. Bullying, threatening, but ultimately getting away with it. When the investigation started, of course, he put his whole energies into subverting it. To I, I don't know if there'd ever been any times before where people had gone to the police to complain about his behaviour. And it had just been half-heartedly investigated or not investigated at all or told that they can't touch him because he's got such high influence and his thoughts at those times would have been yeah I'm in you know you're the inferior being I'm the superior being I'm in power uh, you know I'm in power here I'm the one that's in control here yeah the politicians might have the titles and the names but really it's the people like me that are the ones in power and also in the media industry, he was huge in the media industry and he made his friends. He would make sure that the right people he, he, he had as his, not allies because it's suggesting that they were up to things that they, they shouldn't have been up to, but he certainly made sure that he had the right people on his side and for years... That I've been kind of facing up to now for some time. So, um, and I mean, I made a statement yesterday so you know my thoughts and feelings. It's all a load of nonsense. Um, I just find it hard to kind of accept, I suppose, that, you know, uh, women 30, 40 odd years later can make complaints like this. And they when remain anonymous. It did get to court, and they were quite tenacious in their investigation of him, the police, and good for them. And when it did get to court, he held, and even the judge said, that he held the whole proceedings in that level of contempt that is unique to people that are narcissists. You know, he was thin-skinned, he would round on people. It, he wouldn't think twice about throwing anybody under the bus if it saved his skin. He may have been an ally to them one minute, and then if he thought that that could actually be used as part of his, his defence, he would then com completely round on them. So, you know, not only are they kind of manipulative, but they're also vicious and angry and nasty people you know if you think of somebody like that kind of trapped into a uh, a, a corner you know very hypocritical very hypocritical of course you know they might say one thing one minute and then completely turn it around but blame you for mislistening or not getting the facts right or because they're their facts which are always switching around and changing all the time in their head to suit their particular narrative and that sense of entitlement that people like Clifford would have had. I'm entitled to do this. I've had a stream of hundreds of girls walking through my doors over the years and one or two of them have complained. One of them actually said afterwards that she didn't go to the authorities in the first place because she knew, and she was probably quite right at the time, that she would be dismissed as a, a fantasist or a compulsive liar and she didn't want that hassle. But, you know, she found the strength to carry on through and actually report him. And that was, I believe, one of the cases that he was convicted for. So, you know, good for you. You actually did the right thing and amazing. So finally, let's just have a think about what his thoughts would have been when he got sent to prison. So he's convicted, not believing, not buying into the whole judicial system when it suited him, you know, when it was clients and people that he was actually having to look after and make money from. Of course, he would play the judicial system and the police and the authorities all off against one another and the, the press, etc., etc., all off against one another to get what he wanted. But when it actually came to him... He was powerless. He couldn't do that. But he was contemptuous. That was the last thing that he had left for him to hold the whole thing in a complete disregard. And he was above it all. 
not so above it all that he didn't get jailed for eight years but those would have been his thoughts he wouldn't have taken he would have taken it seriously but he wouldn't have taken it that seriously because he didn't buy into it this to him it was just a nightmare it was just a nightmare that was happening that would be over soon because he was the supremo PR and well-connected person Max Clifford he was a really dislikable character he was you know you could there was a air about him you know hindsight is a brilliant and marvelous and wonderful thing of course it is but there was there's certain people that you know aren't somebody that you really want to get close to or have anything to do with because you know that they are disreputable you know that it's all about them ultimately you might be employing them for such and such a project to keep somebody's name out of the paper say for instance but you know then you will owe them and that's how just to go back to Jimmy Savile that's how he got away with what he got away with for such a long time I'm, I'll do a psychology of crime about Savile a little bit later because there are some really interesting points there but we'll, I'll go into that a little bit later so yes Max Clifford he was um no empathy for anybody it was just all about him and he would do absolutely anything to save his own skin including implicating people that were quite probably innocent as well but dismissing you know I think that's what his main defense was was to be completely dismissive of any of the stories or any of the facts as you'd say any of the facts that were presented to him as part of prosecution and that's often what sexual predators will do they will be completely dismissive of what goes on they don't care they don't care about the psychological damage they and the emotional manipulation they don't care about that because they've got what they wanted back then but they're also kind of getting what they want now and sometimes it just doesn't get taken to court they're kind of advised or they're given a little interview and they doesn't go anywhere and that kind of just would just bolstered him up to carry on doing what he was doing because in his head he's entitled to do this that sense of entitlement that sense of you know impunity that he would have thought that he would have had and when he got taken to court it was completely contempt he was contempt of the system he was contempt of the judge even the judge at his trial noted that he was completely contemptuous of the whole situation which I don't suppose kind of influenced his, his jailing at all but it was noted and those are the important things because when judges make notes it's always written down and it's kept forever so these were the things that people you know it's a little thing but it's something that goes in the history of the likes of Clifford so he's just completely disavowed and dishonored and his reputation is completely torn to shreds which as it should be because he was a highly manipulative and highly prolific paedophile and sexual predator so those were my thoughts about the thoughts of Max Clifford at a few points in his life so thanks ever so much for watching and if I could ask you to like and subscribe and please leave some comments be below that's all really important stuff and if you'd like a little bit more detail about criminals about how they think what their you know kind of mindset was at when they were committing their crimes and afterwards then I do a podcast called why killers kill which is on all the usual platforms google apple that sort of thing and I'll put a link to it below until next time thanks ever so much for watching and goodbye.